God be with you. Where did all of you come from? Where have you been for the last 19 months? It's good to see you all here. It's good to be here and be back in the space. Uh, let me get adjusted here. <laughs> there we go. To be back in the space and to be back doing this again, being here for worship. So welcome, welcome, welcome. This is really going to put a cramp in my uh, weekends off now. <laughs> oh well, that's okay. Suppose it comes with the territory. Um, so we're doing things a little bit differently, you can tell. Um, we're asking that you wear your masks at all times, even for singing. I know, I know. I'll be removing my mask so that you can hear me. There's enough, should be enough distance here. Um, and the lector will be removing uh, his or her mask when they're reading. But other than that, we're asking that you keep your masks on at all times. Um, we're asking also that you remain seated for the entire time. So stand to sing, we'll remain seated. And we'll remain seated uh, for communion. When it comes to communion, you should have received a little baggie as you came in with a little uh, with a wafer and a plastic uh, cup with wine or grape juice in it. Uh, when the time comes and when I say the words to eat and you'll see me eat, that's your cue to we'll all eat together. Uh, when it's time to, to uh, drink and I drink, then we'll all drink together. I'll give you a bit of a warning though about taking the lid <laughs> off of that. Be careful. Go slow. You've got your nice Sunday clothes on. You'd hate to spill wine on it. <laughs> so be careful as you do that. Uh, they are a bit tight and they can be a little so but please, please be careful. I thought about putting um, paper towel in every pew just in case <laughs> But I'm trusting that you know you know what you're doing. Uh, um, at the end of the service, when we're done, uh, there'll be an usher that will usher you out. And we'll start from the back of the, the sanctuary and proceed to the front. And so when you've been, when the usher indicates that it's your turn to, to leave, that's when you can go. So we don't get a big rush going through the aisle. We're trying to keep some distance as well, as best as we can. We won't be gathering for coffee in the hall, at least not for the first little while. But if you want to visit outside, it actually looks like it's going to be a fairly decent day. It's not sunny, but temperature's not too bad. And as long as it isn't raining, you can visit all afternoon if you'd like. So uh, please, please do so outside. Um, I will remember, I will remind you that when you come in, to register with the person with the clipboard to make sure that your name and your phone number is recorded. We need to keep track of who is here um, each Sunday. So please uh, come in. If they don't recognize you right away because maybe your hair has changed or something else has changed or you're wearing a mask, <laughs> let them know your name and your phone, how, how these uh, uh, measures are having an impact on our ability to worship. Um, so, so please do let us know how, how you're feeling. Give me a call or send me an email or speak to anybody on church council. That would be great. We really appreciate uh, any, any feedback, good, bad, negative, positive. It's all, it's all valuable. It's all valuable. I think that's all we need to know for this, this morning, doing things this morning. Um, there's a few other announcements, though. We have a newsletter. I've been sending out newsletters, uh, weekly, bi-weekly you know, bi kind of basis, 
uh, by email. For those who don't get email and didn't get a newsletter this last week, there are extra newsletters out there uh, in, the, in the Narthex. So if you want to grab one of those on your way out, uh, you can do that as well. We have an AGM coming up. Uh, we have a semi, they're going to happen simultaneously. They're going to be on the same day. So November 21st is the day that we'll be doing that. So after church that day, we're in the hall, and we'll be having our, our AGM and our semi-annual meeting, and we'll finally get to pass all those reports we should have done back in March or whenever it was we were supposed to have done that. Uh, uh, and then uh, uh, we'll also be looking forward to the next year and electing people for uh, church council, uh, passing a budget, doing all those things. So we're, it's going to be a bit of an omnibus kind of a, a, a day. We'll be doing lots of things, but um, it's, it's important that we get that business part done as well. And our crafters are getting back at it again. So if you're crafty, well, the crafters are getting together. Their magic. And I also want to say a word of thanks. Thanks to all of you for being patient throughout this time, for being faithful throughout these last 19 months. Um, thank you to the people who helped with the uh, services, getting the services online. Kim and Vivian and Lenore and Denise and everybody who, who kind of worked to, to make that happen. Um, that's uh, an amazing process. Uh, and it's, it's a little bit unfortunate that we have to go live because uh, when I would make mistakes, I could always say, oh, hold it, time, time out, let's, let's do that again. <laughs> and then we just edit it out. Can't do that when you're live. So now you're just going to see how human I really am, <laughs> if that wasn't obvious before. So, okay. Is there anything else that we need to know? Anything that people need to say? Are we getting? Yeah. I was gonna say, are we getting sound? Is it working? Yeah. So. Okay. Okay. You're welcome. You're my pleasure. <laughs> yes, and so we are live streaming. And so if um, you can't make it to church on Sunday, and you're still in your pajamas at 10 o'clock, <laughs> we're live streaming. You can go to our website, our homepage, and there's a link there. You click on it, uh, and you'll be able to see us live. There are people, I'm assuming, who are doing that this morning, and so good morning to all of you as well. <laughs> so, and then it will be uploaded, that's right. It's uploaded again onto YouTube, and so it can be viewed at a, at a later time as well, anytime during the week. Okay, if there's nothing else we need to say or do, uh, we'll take some time for, for silence to prepare ourselves for worship before we begin. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose teaching is life, whose presence is sure, and whose love is endless. Amen. Let us confess our sins to one another, uh, to the one who welcomes us with an open heart. Amen. 
God, our comforter, like lost sheep, we have gone astray. We gaze upon abundance and see scarcity. We turn our faces away from injustice and oppression. We exploit the earth with our apathy and grief. Free us from our sin, gracious God. Listen when we call out to you for help. Lead us by your love to love our neighbors as ourselves. Amen. All have sinned as you righteous. Receive with glad hearts the forgiveness of all your sins. Amen. Amen. And our first hymn, God is here. As we, your people, need to offer praise and prayer, may we find in fuller measure what it is in Christ we share. Here as in the world around us, all our Varied skills and arts wait the coming of the Spirit into open minds and hearts. In our symbols to remind us of our lifelong need of grace. Hear our tables, God and Baltic, hear the cross as central place. Hear in honesty the preaching, hear in silence as in speech, hear in newness and renewal. Here our children find a welcome in the shepherd's flock and fold. Here is bread and wine can Christ sustains us as the Lord. Hear the servants of the servant. Seeking worship to explore what it means in 
And so that would have been one of those instances <laughs> where we'd say, cut, <laughs> let's do this again, but we're live, we're human, forgive us. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. in the world, for the health of the church, for the unity of all, for this holy house, for all who worship and let us pray to the Lord, let us pray to the Lord, Kyrie eleison, on the world and on our way, Kyrie That we may live out your impassioned response to the hungry and the poor. That we may live out truth and justice and grace. Let us pray to the Lord. Let us pray to the Lord. Kyrie eleison on our world and on our way. For peace in our hearts, for peace in our homes, for friends and family, for life and for love, for our work and our play, let us pray to the Lord, let us pray to the Lord. Kyrie eleison, on our world and on our way, Kyrie on every day for your spirit to guide that you center our lives in the water and the word that you nourish our souls with your body and blood let us pray to the Lord let us pray to the Lord Kyrie eleison on our world and on our way, Kyrie is on every day. The Lord, the Lord. Let us pray. Eternal light, shine in our hearts. Eternal wisdom, scatter the darkness of our ignorance. Eternal compassion, have mercy on us. Turn us to seek your face and enable us to reflect your goodness through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our readings. First reading, Job chapter 42. After the glorious vision of creation contained in God's speeches at the end of Job, the righteous sufferer proclaims that he has seen God and is humbled. The Lord restores Job's fortunes and Job dares to live again, fathering more children and giving his daughters an inheritance along with their brothers. Here begins the reading. Job answered the Lord, I know that you can do things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? 
Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you declare to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes seize you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends. And the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then there came to him all his brothers and sisters and all who had known him before. And they ate bread with him in his house. They showed him sympathy and comforted him for all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. And each of them gave him a piece of money and a gold ring. The Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. And he had 14,000 sheep. 6,000 camels, a 1,000 yoke of oxen, and a 1,000 donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters. He named the first Jemima, the second Kazaka, and a third Karen Hapuch. In all the land, there were no women so beautiful as Job's daughters, and their father gave them an inheritance along with their brothers. After this, Job lived 140 years and saw his children and his children's children, four generations. And Job died old and full of days. Hear what the Spirit is saying. Thanks be to God. Psalm 34 verses one to eight. I will bless the Lord at all times. The praise of God shall ever be in my mouth. I will glory in the Lord, let the lowly hear and rejoice. Proclaim with me the greatness of the Lord. Let us exalt God's name together. I sought the Lord who answered me and delivered me from all my terrors. Look upon the Lord and be radiant and let not your faces be ashamed. I called in my affliction and the Lord heard me and saved me from all my troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear the Lord and delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are they who take refuge in God. Second reading, Hebrews chapter seven, verses 23 to 28. A reading from Hebrews. Human priests of old offered sacrifice for their own sins and served only until their death. In contrast, Jesus is God's son, the holy, sinless, resurrected high priest. Death not terminate his priestly service, but through his death, he has interceded for our sins. The former priests, many in number, because they were prevented by death from continuing in office, but he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able for all time to save those who approach God through him, since he always lives to make intersection for, intercession for them. For it was fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, blameless, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he has no need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins, and then for those of the people. This he did once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priests those who are subject to weakness. But the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. Hear what the Spirit is saying. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have words of eternal life. Hallelujah. 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 The Holy Gospel, according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. 
as Jesus and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, a son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Many cultures and societies have stories that they tell that reflect the attitudes and values of that particular culture or society. Canadians do not have a lot of those kinds of stories, but others do. The Celtic people of Great Britain and Ireland are a prime example. More than just stories of leprechauns, the Celts have a large folklore tradition with stories about heroes and warriors, gods and goddesses, kings and queens, and the various adventures that they get into. The Norse people have an equally large library of legends that reflect their culture. We've likely heard of Thor or Odin or the Valkyries, who are a part of that tradition. Asian communities have their stories. African communities have their stories too. So do South American and Latin American cultures. In North America, the indigenous people have a whole, whole host of stories that speak about their relationship with nature and with the land, which reflect their most deeply held values. As we walk the path of reconciliation and seek a more just and respectful relationship with our indigenous neighbors, hearing those stories will help us to understand and appreciate their culture and their ways. The stories that people tell themselves are extremely important. They help to form a person in their culture and their traditions. Whether those stories are literally true or not is irrelevant to how powerful or how important they are. They are still foundational and essential to understanding who we are. The ancient Israelites had stories like that too. We've been reading excerpts from one such story the past few weeks. The book of Job is the story of a, a righteous man who suffers greatly. Most scholars agree that this is not to be read as history. Rather, it should be read as a meditation on the problem of suffering. It explores questions like, why do people suffer? Why do the innocent suffer? Where is God in my suffering? And what kind of a world is this where suffering seems to be so commonplace? These are questions that are as old as the Bible and older and as new as today's newscast. Just because it cannot be unequivocally verified that there was an actual historical figure named Job who literally endured these things and had this exact experience does not make this story any less powerful. The story of Job is a story that we all know. Anyone who lives any length of time in this world experiences some degree of suffering on some level at some time. The questions this story raises and the issues with which it wrestles are very real and relevant to people of all times and all circumstances and stations in life. Job is every man and every woman. 
His situation may be extreme and far beyond what most of us will ever experience in our lifetime, but it is deliberately so in order to make the plot more compelling and to raise the questions that are the reason for this story being told. So, what's the story of the book of Job? It begins with God getting drawn into a wager with one who is called Satan, or more correctly, the Satan, which literally means the, the accuser, the adversary. Here, Satan is a, a title, not a, a proper name. This is not the same figure as the devil. This is one who is best understood as God's opponent. The one who makes accusations and who goads God into playing games with people. Now that's the first clue that this is not a portrayal of actual events. This prologue, this whole setup for everything that will soon unfold is speculation, is conjecture. The assumption is that something must have happened somewhere to, to cause the events that follow to take place. That assumption is perfectly acceptable. God and the Satan, the accuser, engage in an experiment to see if it is possible for people to remain faithful to God, even in the midst of the most dire of circumstances. They turn their attention to Job. God describes Job by saying, there is no one like him on earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away. God has protected him and shown him great favor and special favor. If he were to meet with a disaster or some personal tragedy, well then, perhaps Job would not be so faithful. And so then, that then becomes the test, to see if Job will remain faithful when confronted with great personal tribulation. So, Job is stricken with catastrophe and adversity like no other. All in one day, Job loses all of his children, all of his servants, all of his oxen, all of his donkeys, all of his sheep, and all of his camel. All that remains of his family and his business is himself and his wife. Job responds by saying, The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. His faith in God remains as strong as ever. Score one point for Job. Shortly after that, Job is suddenly and unexplain unexplainably afflicted with painful sores from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. When his wife questions his trust in God, Job again remains steadfast in his faith, saying, Shall we receive the good at the hand of God and not receive the bad? Point number two for Job. But... In time, all this tragedy does get to Job, and he curses the day he was born and wishes he were dead. The largest part of the book describes how Job is visited by three friends who talk to him and console him by trying to come to some kind of understanding of why this has all happened to him. One friend speaks, and Job shoots down all of his arguments. The second one tries, and again, Job snaps back. And then the third one gives it a go, but meets with the same fate. So the first one gives it another try, and around we go, arguing in circles, beating what seems to be a dead horse. Three times each friend tries, and each time Job is left unsatisfied and more frustrated than before. Eventually, Job speaks for himself and challenges God to give him a good reason for all these things that have befallen him. God replies and puts Job in his place, which has the effect of reducing Job to silence. There is no explanation. There is nothing satisfactory that can be said in the face of such tragedy. Feeling his mortality more acutely than ever, Job humbly repents, and admits his limitations. Then in the last half of the final chapter, which we read today, there is an unexpected twist. After all is said and done, after he was utterly exhausted from arguing with his friends and lashing out at God and has come to accept his fate, Job's fortunes are restored 
In fact, his fortunes are restored beyond that of his former wealth. Job receives twice as much as he had before. Oxen, donkeys, sheep, and cattle. He has a second family. His brothers and sisters come and console him, and he lives to see his great-grandchildren. Old, he dies old and full of days. That's a great expression, old and full of days. Those last eight verses, which describe the restoration that Job receives, ties up everything nice and neat with a bow. How nice it would be if every story, every life, every tragedy ended the same way. But we know it doesn't. The entire book of Job seems to stand in contrast to that ending. The bottom line is that the questions raised and debated in this story are not adequately answered. We are given no good or rational explanation for all those questions of suffering and evil that we began with. In the end, God is God, humans are humans, and there is a gap there that just cannot be breached. That does not mean that God is deaf to our cries and our prayers. That does not mean that God does not intend good things for each one of us or that God desires us to live in unity and harmony. That does not mean that God does not act with love and mercy and grace and kindness towards us or that God is incapable of doing so. Perhaps that's what this surprise ending tells us. That God is ultimately a God of love and grace and mercy, even if we don't always understand or experience life that way. Reconciliation and restoration is God's greatest work. It is what God is always up to in the world, this world that is so full of unspeakable and unrelenting tragedy and disaster. Evil exists, and we have no explanation for it. Goodness exists too, and we can't explain our God's way of being in the world. I cannot imagine that, that Job's restoration is not without its pain. Sure, he gets back, back twice as much as he lost, but he's still lost. He lost his children, and that's a pain that never leaves a parent, even, even if there are others. He endured great agony and suffering, and that changes a person too. Job may have gotten back as much as he lost, and more, but he doesn't get back what he lost. And that hurts. That makes it so that things are never quite the same. Still, Job's story is one where we see that goodness is still possible, joy is still possible, and abundant life is still possible, even, even if things are different even if things have changed. When our reopening task force and our church council made the decision a number of weeks ago that this would be the Sunday that we return to in-person worship, I looked at the readings that were appointed for today. The reading, for Job, the, the reading from Job immediately stood out to me. And I wondered if reading about Job's fortunes being restored twofold would be heard as good news or not. We have returned from 19 long months of being away from being physically present in this We're overjoyed and full of gratitude. Where are the balloons? Where are the streamers? Where is the party? Instead, we're starting back slowly and carefully and with some nervousness and hesitation. We're still wearing masks. We keep our distance. We aren't standing at the altar for communion. We aren't gathering afterwards for coffee. Things are different. Things are not the way we would like them or the way that we had hoped they would be. Job may have gotten back twice as much as he lost, but it feels like we've only got back half, or maybe a third. But we are getting back. It's so nice, so nice to see people in the pews again. It's my sincere hope that we will continue to meet like this and will not have to go back to the way it's been for the past year and a half. I pray that today represents the cautious restart that we have been anticipating for so long. And we are doing the best we can to start back on that long journey back. The story of Job 
is one of the stories that we tell ourselves to help us to understand who we are. Job's story is our story. We experience life as difficult sometimes. We have stuff that comes at us from out of left field. We scratch our heads and wonder what we did to deserve it or what we did to bring it on. We search for meaning in suffering and come up empty. It's frustrating. It's annoying. And it sometimes makes us wonder if there is a God and whether that God is as good as we have been led to believe. Or does God just play games with us? We get where Job is coming from. And we look for a way to move on. So, if this is our story, then what do we conclude? There is no satisfactory answer to the question of suffering. But suffering is not without meaning. Despite all the evil and tragedy that we endure, goodness is still possible. Joy is still possible. An abundant life is still possible. Even if things are different. Even if things have changed. Living through this pandemic has changed us. We are not the same as we were before. So how can we expect our world to be? And in that changed world, there is still love and grace, and kindness, and compassion, and mercy. We are still living through this pandemic. The pandemic is not over, and we remain a work in progress. Today, today we start down that road, reminded that rescue is possible, even if things will not be exactly as they were before. We are assured that God walks with us on that road too, with us watching out for us, working with us, wanting the best for us. Life changes, world changes, we change. And goodness is still possible because God still loves us. Amen. Amen. Go now by the power of the Holy Spirit to be the church in mission, to do the will of God in the world. Amen. We continue as we sing our next hymn, The Church of Christ in Every Age. in every age he said by change but spirit led and keep on rising from the dead across the world across the street the victims of injustice cry for shelter and for bread to eat that never live before they die then let the servant church arise a caring church that longs to be a partner in Christ's sacrifice and clothed in Christ's humanity. We alone, whose blood was shed, can cure the fever in our blood and teach us how to share. We have no mission but to serve in full obedience to our Lord.
with the whole church. Let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Hear us, O God. Set free from sin and death and nourished by the word of truth, we join in prayer for all of God's creation, saying, Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Risen One, we give you thanks for congregations and ministries throughout the world that serve as centers of prayer and action. Empower missionaries, teachers, healers, evangelists, and all who are sent to share your song of joy. Hear us, O God. Holy One, we give you thanks for generous land that produce abundant harvests. Strengthen and protect all soils, from rooftop gardens to prairie farmlands, to patio planters to fertile valleys, and bless all who lovingly tend them. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Ruling One, we give you thanks for leaders of nations who work to build up the common good. Strengthen efforts of reconciliation among all nations, that peace extends in every direction. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Healing One, we give you thanks for all who labor for the health of others. Comfort and strengthen all who struggle with chronic pain. Send healing and relief to all who are sick, especially those we name aloud or in the silence of our hearts. Providing one, we give you thanks for all who provide for others. Inspire generosity in your people so that we carry out the work of making disciples of all nations. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Living one, we give you thanks for the saints who have increased our faith. Give us courage to follow in hope until you gather us around the table, your table of abundance. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Confident you, that you hear us, O God, we boldly place our prayers into your hands. Through Jesus Christ, our truth and life. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. I will invite you to share the peace with the person next to you, <laughs> if they're part of your bubble. Or if you want to turn around and wish peace to others as you see them. <laughs> peace, peace, peace. <laughs> Okay, and we'll continue uh, with our offering. So we have an offering plate at the back of the church. If you didn't see it on your way in, to place your offering. Um, so uh, each week we'll bring the offering forward as has been our uh, uh, habit in the past, uh, but we won't be passing the plate. So as you come in next time, feel free to place your offering in that plate. Let's play. Thank <laughs> you. 
Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. Through your goodness you have blessed us with these gifts, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. Use us and what we have gathered in feeding the world with your love. Through the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our hearts we lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is, in, it is right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death in the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. You are indeed holy, almighty and merciful God. You are most holy, and great is the majesty of your glory. You so loved the world that you gave your only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. We give you thanks for his coming into the world to fulfill for us your holy will, and to accomplish all things for our salvation. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, given for you. Do this for, the for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Remembering, therefore, his salutary command, his life-giving passion and death, his glorious resurrection and ascension, and the promise of his coming again, we give thanks to you, O Lord God Almighty, not as we ought, but as we are able. We ask you, to merciful, we ask you mercifully to accept our praise of bread and wine, so that all who share in the body and blood of Christ may be filled with heavenly blessing and grace, and receiving the forgiveness of sins, may be formed to live as your holy people, and be given our spirit, be all honor and glory in your holy church, now and forever. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those sin against us. Save us from the time of trial. Deliver us from evil. For the kingdom the power and the glory
the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Already, this is your time to take out your communion baggie <laughs> and to take the wafer. This is the body of Christ given for you. I'm hearing the pops. You're getting your wine ready. Good. This is the blood of Christ for you. Amen. Sounds I thought I'd never hear in church. <laughs> the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in grace now and forever. Amen. Let us pray. Lord of life, in the gift of your body and blood, you turn the crumbs of our faith into a feast of salvation. Send us forth into the world with shouts of joy, bearing witness to the abundance of your love in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. People of God, you are Christ's body, bringing new life to a suffering world. The Holy Trinity, one God, bless you now and forever. Amen. Our final hymn today is, Lord, dismiss us with your blessing.
Thanks, Pete. And one thing I forgot to say, what do you do with that stuff left over from communion? Just leave it in the pew and we'll pick it up afterwards. So just tuck it in the little hymn holders or on the seat or wherever you want to do it. Um, we'll, we'll get it afterwards. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, oh. Suit. Yes, that's right. Hi. Good morning.